to another episode of Savvy Seeks. I'm your host, Savvy, Dr. Savvy. Uh, I've got with me some special guests, and uh, this time around we've got a program that is focusing more on actual volunteers that go out into the thick of it. And when we mean the thick of it, we mean the fact that they get off the plane and, well, we want to hear it in terms of uh, from the actual person that's been out there uh, and actually seen it and how he picks himself up and goes forward. Now, the two guests I've got with me, I'll let them introduce themselves, but uh, very quickly, uh, we've got Andrew Duncan and also Ravi Singh from Carter Aid. Uh, they work very closely together. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Andrew. Um, you know, what do you do? What's your real job? You know? um, I manage a small branch of Barclays in Langley. Um, that's, that's my day-to-day job. And uh, Ravi, obviously with Carter Aid, is a customer of ours, and that's how I got to be introduced to him. Great. Thanks so much for coming on the show, by the way, just to kind of, you know, inspire us about what you've done. Uh, but also what other people have done as well. And then the fact that you've actually been out to some of these really kind of uh, calamity-based zones, you know, I call them calamity, it's a disaster. Mm. Um, And sometimes I think to myself that, is there a situation where uh, people respond, like, for example, to the Disaster Emergencies Committee, they get the money, they do the stuff, but then it becomes like yesterday's news because there's still, like, problems out there? Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Progress very slow, and you've just seen it for yourself as well. It's quite shocking. Right, absolutely. Well, we'll hear from you in a minute about, you know, first-hand experience about what actually happens out there. Ravi, you've been on the programme before, um, way back, uh, I think about three weeks ago, uh, and we were talking about um, just general, um, you know, service and that kind of thing. Uh, You started up this organisation about 12 years ago. What's the future? 1999. Okay. Well, 12 years ago, I'm pretty fast. As I say, future is bright, future is orange, and uh, our colours are orange, <laughs> right. and uh, yeah. calls are colours are orange, t-shirts are orange, mm-hmm. and we stand out amongst a million when we go with our turban and beard, but obviously not Andrew, soon. <laughs> 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 so um, so uh, the future is basically, I think, Carl's Aid has become a people's charity, right. which has probably, will cause headaches to people who don't want the seats to succeed. Okay, well, there is yeah. that possible contention yeah, so, as well, uh, you, know, you know. Future is, uh, from you, we say the right to culture. Right. I think we talk about the political side, like the land, etc., but we don't talk about the mind side. Mm. When you're actually there and you're telling who Sikhs are in the middle of a disaster area, for instance, Haiti or Libyan Tunisian border, and you know. That's just incidental, that only mm. just comes up as a question, doesn't it? Yeah. They, they don't, you don't go out there and go, hey, I'm no, going to put a service, by the way, I'm going to talk to you about what Sikhs are. It no, just I comes mean, Andrew is the same, so we don't, you know, we don't go out as missionaries. Yeah, well, we, we don't believe in that. that. We're not allowed to do that anyway. We don't believe in that. I think that's just, yeah. I, I think that's emotional blackmail. When somebody needs someone, you're kicking them in the teeth more. Yeah, well, there are situations and there are certain people, and uh, you, know, you and I have seen those <coughs> examples where sometimes um, it's almost like religion is held as a ransom to actually get an aid. Yeah, uh, and that's sometimes when I look at that, I think to myself, well, that's kind of going against the actual whole foundation of actually having a religion. A Sikh religion doesn't actually do that. We don't hold anyone to hands, and we don't convert anyone. We're not into missionary mm. work. We're into service. You know, kind of uh, get on with it. You know, mm. as well. So one thing I want to ask you, you know, just you were talking about it earlier on. So you and your friends get off the plane, right? Is it like, do you, how do you feel? What what happens when you get off? You, you go there. Is it really as bad as, you, as the, the video and everything else that we see on the feeds over here? Oh, I'll never forget my friend's face the second time I went there. It was their first time and there was just utter shock. And within the 10 minutes, they were thinking both things. They told me later that day that they almost wanted to go back because they just weren't prepared for how bad it really was, despite seeing footage on TV and um, knowing kind of what they were going into, just seeing it uh, for their own eyes, shocked them. Um, so what are they? I mean, how do you mean shock? They like, you know, they kind of, the faces drop, and they, yeah. they think like, what can I do? What can I do? It's too much. Or? Just the state of the, you know, this was a capital city. Yet they were driving by, and you just see shacks and you know, um, huts built out of bits of wood here and there, and bits of metal. And there was a market with just clothes stacked on the floor, on the floor, rubbish everywhere, water just dripping, and it was just filthy. And they couldn't believe that this was people's lives and their homes. And they say it was just utter shock in their face. I think but the point also to make is that was a year and three months or something after mm. the earthquake, isn't it? And it was still that condition, which is more shocking. Mm. Corruption caused it yeah. to remain as it was. And yeah. also that you know, the Haitian people were aware that so many people around the world donated money and you hear two billion pounds or two billion dollars. 
but they haven't seen the money and they're growing impatient as well. Um, is it because they're, they're trying to set up programs so that the money is used properly or do you think that some of the money goes into corruption? Um, I, don't, I don't want you to kind of quote any of that. I'm just saying, what's, no. I'm not asking you for your view, but do you think that's what they think? Well, unfortunately, I think there uh, probably is. You know, I was speaking to an American guy recently. We think it's the most corrupt country in the world. Mm. Um, mm. And when we were there the, the, the first time, we didn't realise that they were flying out to the national election, so that was a bit scary. But they were, I think they're waiting for a stable government to come in before they put this money in. Okay. Otherwise, they're just going to see it fritter away through corruption right. and just go to no use. But at the same time, the people on the floor are getting impatient because they're not seeing this money that people have donated and they're still living in absolute dire so, swamp. Uh, do you think as a trained banker, right, did you, and there were uh, skills that you could, when you went out there, you immediately put into place? Um, is there things that you can give an example of where, you know, for example, you're probably quite well organised what kind of things did you do when you went out there? Um, I just think the, f the first thing is being able to talk to people, talk to the locals and uh, just sort of try and partly integrate with them um, but not feel like you're important, not feel like you know, you're know you saving them um, and so I ended up making many good friends from Haitian people mm. and it's just treating them with respect really and, and in turn they gave me respect back. Because there's a, a dignity thing as well isn't there I guess? Yeah. Um, I wanted to say to the audience that's out there, later on what we're going to do is we are actually going to take some calls as well. Uh, so if you want some direct questions that you want to put to our guests today, you know, maybe you're thinking about doing volunteering or maybe you want to kind of seek firsthand um, basically what's actually happening out there. Now, um, you've been to Haiti a couple of times. There are other things that you've done. Recently you've done some water uh, distribution over in Libya, haven't you? On the Libyan border to, where's the Libyan border to what? Tell us a bit more about uh, that. Yeah, it was um, the Libyan conflict in the early days caused, uh, I think, half a million immigrants who were working in the oil industry, etc., in Libya to leave to flee the country. Right. They got caught in between, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, they were fleeing. They were robbed as well by the local okay. Libyan Didn't military. Well. Is it really? No. So no, it doesn't. Anyway, mm -hmm. so they were. We were working on the. It's called a camp, Shusha camp, on the borders of Tunisia and Libya. Was that, is that one of their terms, or is that? It's a town called Shusha. It's a basically the, um, uh, on on the border. It's a very is there yeah. is the main town. Then you got a little town, and the camp became known that at a, one time the camp had 30,000 people. people yeah. And when you uh, walk into that camp, you're working in Tunisia, and it's French and Arabic. Now, luckily the way we work we always approach local organizations to work with us so the tunisian rotary club new generation club in tunis contacted them they spoke english very very good got on with them made links so when we landed they waited for us mm. picked us up at the airport made arrangements to go and visit the camp so they could speak the language and these are all foreign workers not libyans they were all foreign workers right. africans asian bangladeshis right. Pakistanis. Pakistanis are very happy to see us. Bangladesh is really happy. So Dadi said, help us, we need help. But we had to make an assessment. It was probably, I think, probably the most violent place we worked so far. Really? It was mass fights. Mm. Uh, you're what, standing fight, there. Fights for food or fights for There's like uh, queues, like uh, imagine you're in the desert. It's in the desert. Right. Very, very hot. Mm. Lack of water. People are queuing up like four hours to get some food. They're like uh, dehydrating as well. Dehydrating, standing, no shade. You're queuing up four hours, like half mile queues, no joke. Mm. Queues going around the camp. Suddenly, some of the troublemakers, they were known. There were some countries are labeled saying, watch out for these certain African countries. They cause headaches. And uh, they would push in, okay. and that was it. Right. It will erupt. Food will get chucked away. Um, broken bones, fatalities. And you were just watching it. I remember the first day I got there with the Rotary Club guys. There was a lady, a guy, and a driver. And, and these Malians were marching on the road. They want to go back to Mali. Mm. It's not our fault. It's not the NGO's fault. The Mali government has got the money. The UN will not put them up yet. So they were demonstrating on the road. As we pa passed, they saw us pass. They ran after the car. It's in a little video clip. All right, yeah. They're trying to attack the car. And then when we got there, there was a tiny military, like as big as a studio place. And they're trying to control all this. So I stood in the side of this army camp thinking, it's okay, this guy comes up with a massive rock. I got a photo on one of my Facebook camps and he's trying to chuck it and he looked at me. He's like, 
what's this guy with a beard and turban? Who's right. this guy? Right. He's like totally shocked and then he just went like that and walked off. Okay. I'm thinking, whoa. So that was the latest one and most violent and uh, a couple of other volunteers went. My missus went as well to see what we do actually. Mm. It's not holiday, what we go and get up to. Right. And the day Baljeet Singh from Kalta and the missus went, it was the most violent day. There was oh, a right. thousand or fifteen hundred guys, imagine that, right. fighting each other. Okay. You can see them coming towards you, going back, cars moved out, dragged them into the tent. The people in the tent cooking broke the space to get ready for the sticks to fight back. Unbelievable. It was, it was uh, I think, an eye opener. Right. So uh, that was, <laughs> but we delivered water. We, you know, we're determined. I I the, I the, yeah. We're not shying away. We don't just, like I said many times, put some boxes together, take a photo, say, look what we're doing. We're doing substantial work now. Right. With other NGOs, talking local grassroots organisations. Tell us a little bit about. I mean, let's go back to Haiti for a second. But thanks for that, by the way, Roger. That's quite terrifying in one sense. I was but in Windsor having a meal with my family when he texts me, literally just after it happened, saying it's one of the most dangerous days of my life right. in there. And obviously, I was in a different world, but I kind of just wish. You know, I, was I often think that I've kind of blogged about it on my uh, blog site. You know, uh, I've I've said well. You know, like there's so much difference in the world, isn't there? There's there's a part of the world which is really, really rich, and another part of the world which is really poor. And there's there's almost like we live in a sense of like that Phil Collins song. You know, it's just another day in paradise. Mm -hmm. You know, it is another day in paradise mm -hmm. over here. Whereas, um, and I've given this example before, uh, where I met somebody from the Peace Corps in the U.S. And the Peace Corps is quite interesting. I think it was started up by um, uh, John F. Kennedy, and and they go over for a year. Uh, if they want to take a gap year or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this girl was telling me that she'd got to this village, uh, an African village that happened to be in quite a deep part of Kenya. And um, the, the kids were just looking at the shoes going, those are shoes, you know? I mean, you, you've got that level <laughs> of, yeah. you've mm -hmm. got that level of difference. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's so unfair, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, horrific. Children uh, hated enough shoes, do they? No. Right. I, mean, I was playing football in the field with bare thick stones running with my trainers and just bumping my shoes and they're just running around barefoot Foot, yeah. and just the heads can believe it if wow. you gave them slippers or shoes that would be like a, the biggest gift ever well the day of um, my last day the second time I gave a really run down pair of Ashton trainers to one young lad that I've been speaking to a lot and he was having me like I'd given the best present in the world yeah. Yeah. wow um, so you, you go out there and you do this work and then how does it work in terms of do you do you have to sometimes stay in the camp or do you actually go uh, and travel out and stay with, with lots of other NGOs or did it, did it previously Ravi was when he done how many missions four five yeah. missions previously we put it this way you got in Haiti Port-au-Prince which is a city where you land a main city where most of the NGOs were working in the beginning because most of the media was there but the epicenter of the earthquake was in a rural area mm. For instance, give you an example, like the media and the work would happen in London, in Punjab, but the epicenter was, say, for instance, uh, going towards uh, Amritsar or something, that a distance. Okay, so it's quite so, far Yeah, so we chose to work in the epicenter area where nobody was working. And uh, we worked with some Mexicans and Dominican Republic guys and found an old t-shirt factory. And uh, it's big, the factory's got cracks on the walls, but we didn't stay inside, we used their storage. It was set in a really beautiful area with mango trees, old, no security at the time. Mm. So we said, we'll take over this, how much you want to rent a month? The guy was arguing first, then he said, okay, you can have it free. He, goes, um, he was amazed to see the seats there first. Right. So us three, Dominican Republic and the Mexican guys, so we funded everything, they helped. We ripped out the old toilets. This factory was shut for 16 years. Ripped out the showers, made Camp Unity. If you look at Carl Said video on Carl Said channel, You'll see Camp Video Haiti, Camp, right. uh, Camp Unity Haiti. It was amazing atmosphere. For eight months, we say to you, NG, you're coming around from the world. We put water pumping, so fresh water's coming in. We bought water, water drinking. We put a uh, uh, you know, launderer person that wash your clothing. We put a professional cook. So all you pay is $10 a night. Where the hotel, even the rundown hotel we were staying, was about 80 to $100 a night. Do you think they put the price up because they knew you guys had come of from course. abroad? Yeah. It's just an expensive country, isn't it? Yeah, I think mean, it's not the time the most expensive poor country. So you work all day, and then you got, and then what's the distance to get to the hotel? Luckily, where we were working, we were very close to where, right in the middle, where the orphanages were. So it wasn't too big an issue. Five miles radius, maybe. Yeah, and we mm. had the driver as well. 
So again, we were never walking on foot and uh, looked after pretty well. Right. But well, in the beginning, me yeah. and Mandeeps and Khalsa, when we went, we stayed in Port-au-Prince. Right. To set that up, took us a few days. Okay. Or maybe a week or so. Right. We were going every day in three hours traffic. Oh man. I oh, think right. if somebody from Punjab, the Diana traffic or London rush hour traffic. Right. Three hours in the dusty, hot, polluted areas in, on the roads and to, to work in those areas. And it was more tiring going and coming back. So we, when we got the tents, the American Sikhs went over as well, the Canadian Sikhs, right. they helped us. And we brought the tents in. You know, although we stayed in the tents, and there's Karunpur, Paramjit Singh, Ravi Gil, all these guys went over. Right. But it was a great atmosphere. We were working with maybe 50 other guys in the camp from 20 different organizations staying in Carl Save camp. I guess that's one question I had on my list, which was that, um, was more about NGOs. I mean, we kind of touched on it, on it earlier on with regards to how you interact with them. But my question is more focused on how you, you know, you, you decided to do this thing in this factory. How do you prioritize what you're going to do? So you, you land in this country, right? Have you thought about it before you've flown out? Or have you spoken to NGOs and said to them, look, these are the priority areas. Where can we help? I mean, how, how organized is it? Or how disorganized is it? And when you arrive, you try and put some order in place. Well, uh, that's my job initially, is right. to sort everything out when there's a disaster. How are we going to react? Like I gave you an example of Libya. Right. We always find our local grassroots groups who, who are not involved in this. Right. But they probably got... So you connected to organizations We connected to local country. organization. No, no, in Tunisia. Right. I contact them because they're on the Tunisian Libyan border. And uh, it was a Rotary Club. Right. I said, I know you don't do this. Do you, help, do you help your people? Do you want to help the refugees? Because Libya Tunisia border is open. Right. They married, get married into each other's villages, so okay. there's no restriction. So Libyans and Tunisians are very close to each other. And they said, of course, what can we do? Well, we'll say, we'll pay all expensive flights or whatever to do whatever in the different islands. Uh, we want your knowledge, expertise, and buying and purchasing and supplying. Okay. So, but uh, Haiti was very unusual. We only had one contact, and we could have opened a camp, set up something in the middle of Port-au-Prince, saying, "Look what we're doing to show the world." But what we do, we reach out to the needy areas. So when we landed in Port-au-Prince, we got picked up by a contact, and uh, United Haitians from the London Dictionary contact, but they didn't know much. Then we had to go out into the camps, into the field, make contacts. And uh, in Port-au-Prince at the time, we needed water tanks. So we started installing, buying water tanks, installing them. Then we make a Mexican dude by, by just by chance. So you, you use the local labor to do that? Local labor. We, right. we, we don't take anything from here. So do they get paid for that? They get paid for it. And Carlsa Aid never takes 15, 20, 10, 30 people over. I mean, if I'm going to be doing something effective, I'm going to look after 15 people, worry about them. I'm going to worry about me and the other person, work together in a foreign country, give each other support, get on with it, and use local uh, labor and pay them because they need payment. They had a disaster in the country, so you could actually help them. So we utilize everything locally. How does this um, affect you? I mean, when was the last time you went over, and how does it affect you emotionally? Uh, well, I went, uh, came back just early July. Um, They're quite recent then. Yeah. yeah, and um, I mean, emotionally, it was, it was obviously quite challenging at first, but I mean, after playing with the children, um, it, it really sort of touches you inside. And so when I came back, I felt so positive about seeing the good that we had done, actually delivering the food ourselves, that paying the guys for the water pump, seeing it fixed and the children using it. It just, you know, had such a great feeling inside. It's the first thing I said to him when I got back was, I'm going, I'm going back okay. and taking two friends with me and to did. continue yeah. working and we did. How mm -hmm. do you think it's um, kind of impacted your life in terms of, I know you kind of had that feeling, you could argue that's the thing you got back, uh, but what, how did it affect your life in terms of um, your outlook, what you do every day, um, yeah. like I said, another day in paradise, you know? Yeah, um, instead of just thinking about doing things, I'm actually doing things now so whereas he pushed me into it, he offered it and I said yes I'll do it and then got everything in uh, you know, put everything in motion for me to go I'd always would have said yeah I would like to but never followed it up so as soon as I got back I got everything into place and I'm always going like him when do you need the next mission you know I've always put myself out there now and that's what I'll continue to do because I just really enjoyed the whole experience and it's because you, you get to see parts of the world you'd never see but help people uh, make a difference to their lives and 
yeah, that's what I like doing. Do, do you think that, um, and uh, we had a program before about the, just after the riots happened, um, do you think that if there was a, almost like an initiative where people who didn't have jobs or found it difficult to get jobs, or maybe people who had uh, lost touch with reality, I'm trying to say that in the most sensitive way, um, if there was a kind of program in place where you know, they could go out to these countries, do you think it would make them better people? I know it has for you. Oh. Uh, I'm not saying you are a better person before, you know right and now, you're, yeah. you're an even better person now. <laughs> but do you think that it would? Uh, do you think it would have an impact on those people? I know there are some people that are just you know, are never going to change anyway. But no, I, th I think anyone really, because when, as you were saying earlier, where people are stuck in this world of paradise, um, and then there's a lot. So there's a lot talk about the way the economy is and how our standard of living is going to drop. But it'll never drop to the standard that these people live at. And then when you see for yourself and you feel the, the heat, the dirt, the conditions they're in, it just makes you realise how, how lucky we are. Because they're such a nice, friendly uh, people, you know, never felt unsafe out there. But that's all they know. You know they don't know any, uh, a world where we live in. They can't even fathom it. And so it just really makes you realise how lucky we are to be in this country. Right. I think that the thing is, though, for me, and I, I said about the harmonisation thing, is that I, I think sometimes economists forget that there's an opportunity. I know Chinese, for example, regardless of their agenda, um, they've gone into certain places in Africa and there are certain negative things that are happening out there with regards to what they're doing. Um, but they also, you know, one argument is that they revitalise the country. The other argument is that they possibly might be taking advantage of certain situations for their own economy because they need to get some of the the stuff that's in the soil, you know, mm. the stuff that they need for batteries that we need in our, you know, little gizmos that we buy. Um, I think it's called cadmium, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But um, the, the point I was going to make was that is there not, you being, I mean, obviously, economy, being an economist as well, do you not think there's a missed opportunity with bankers and economists uh, to say, well, if we invested in some of these countries, we could kind of bring those countries up so that they become new markets rather than those countries being suppressed in the way that they are because uh, the trade situation is that they can't, they can't trade and even if they do try to trade there are tariffs and stuff, and stuff that are, are laid down on them you know? but I think in Haiti specifically it's, it's, it's beyond the companies it's political now right. I think America's quite heavily influenced a lot of the political side of it for their own gain um, maybe I'm naive I don't look at the politics I just look at the ec economics you know? yeah, yeah but they um, and the corruption yeah <laughs> but when I was speaking to a couple of Haitians who were quite educated they were explaining how like the last um, president before he was put in by the Americans but because he was closing up to Venezuela and being where they are it was right. quite a strategic place the Americans got rid of him and again because of this influence the corruption big companies can't really afford to set up there because it will just cost them too much and they won't they can't get anything out of there so is, is the, the the thing that's stopping big companies from going into countries like that because you could argue that multinationals can change uh, you know a, a global situation um is it because it's going to cost them too much is, is the cost a barrier or is it the lack of initiative and the fact that they can invest for the long term so say for example you're going to set up an oil you know situation it's not going to take you know it's going to take a five six year program to build the oil plant, extract the oil, do whatever you need to do. Or if you're going to build a factory, you, you know, you can build a factory, it can take two to three years to build the factory. Is the cost high or is it a lack of initiative? What's your view? It's still, it's just politically unstable. The fact that trying to buy land out there is, mm. is horrific because I've heard stories where someone's thought they bought land and then people coming over with guns. Happened in that and, mm. Yeah, and that just shows that because the government don't have a strong police force to enforce laws and then comes up to start paying the right people and it just <clears throat> just get out of control. What stops me from being a pessimist? What, what makes me and you become an optimist to say that things can get better? Um, it's a hard question, but, you know... No, it's very hard. I mean, Digicel, uh, the company out there that Ed is advertising everywhere, and that's the mobile phone operator, and everyone loves the company, and they... Um, because? Why? So Why? Just because it's something that they... Mobile phones, obviously, they all have mobile phones up. Haitian SIM card and if you when you send a couple of texts they'll actually text you to say send one more and you'll get 10 free texts so and but they're the only uh, real so they've almost got a monopoly on the place 
but I guess they've somehow got in and they're operating fine without this sort of corruption, but I think they've been there a while, but it's probably quite challenging for other new companies to want to go set up there because they have to be able to get in and get through that. But Yeah, but also what happened at the earthquake, right? Uh, what we're missing is what you said is America controls Haiti sort of thing, right? So when the earthquake happened, Port au Prince Airport was closed to everybody except Americans. Right. Okay. So if you're an American uh, army or organization, you could land your planes. So America shut everybody out, right? And uh, what happened, even uh, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontiers, they, they had um, special uh, drugs, serums, etc. And they were circling to land, they wouldn't let them land. And okay. that's $2 million medicine gone off because they wouldn't let them land. Mm. And they had to uh, cut Sometimes even in charge. So the America, uh, America will dictate what you do. Right. It's not easy as somebody coming, setting it up. Uh, because like you said, Venezuela is not very far off. But, but the good thing that you guys have done is that you've actually you know, taken it into your own hands and you've gone off and done something. You know? um, you've actually taken that step and got on that plane and got off the plane. <laughs> Mm. and try to do something, you know. Um, oh, we, off the we, plane. Can, we can off the plane, yeah, <laughs> pushed off the plane. <laughs> uh, we are ready to take calls if you want to give us a, a shout. Uh, the number should be on the screen. Uh, feel free to ask Ravi Singh and uh, Andrew any questions you want with regards to what their experience has been like, or maybe you might want to uh, be one of these individuals that's thinking about volunteering and, you know, what kind of issues, are you, maybe you're a parent and, you know, you might want to go, or maybe you're considering... Uh, the fact that your child has said, I wouldn't mind doing volunteering, what's actually involved in it. You don't actually necessarily have to go there. There are plenty of organisations in the UK that, where you can do voluntary work. I'd ask a, a kind of slightly uh, kind of more religious type question in one sense, is that um, when, do you think that, as, this is more of a, you know, a seek, do you think if we're seen in the world as being humanitarian as well as being people that are helping people, you know, because one of the themes in our religion is that we... Uh, we fight for the defenseless, and that's a situation. You're defenseless when there's nothing around you. Um, th th that work that we do, people start recognizing who we are and what we believe in. I think I've uh, spoken to Andrew many times about the political si situation of the Sikhs in India. Mm. You know me, I don't keep my mouth shut on these issues. He knows that as well. Right. And uh, there is well, a. Be careful there, no, 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 nothing to be careful about. <laughs> I mean, the thing is. There is an organized agenda after 1984 because at the time there was a big economic movement as well as a religious movement talking about the issues of Punjab which are now the same, right. farmers' rights, water issues. Absolutely. It's still the same. Mm. The person who raised it, Sanjay Nathak Yeah. they called him a religious fanatic but actually he talked about economics. So when... Well, when you go back in history and you look at the economic, yeah. there is an economic issue. It's the same issue, issue still now. Yeah, absolutely. So what happened in that time, a lot of youngsters come off the drugs, come off intoxicants, started practicing the, the religion, and, uh, you know, which was better for the state. So what they don't want now is the same issue again. Mm. So when, when, you're, when you're a minority in the government, which is very oppressive, which is not just the Sikhs, but all over India there's oppression, uh, they won't paint you as a terrorist. Right. Um, you know, it's not. If America, if America chooses to now say they want to invade somewhere, they'll start painting terrorists. Right. Any country, and then bang. So, so we, uh, Andrew knows I talk to them all, all the time. People would be happy to see a gun in their hand than to give a jug of water to someone or give some food. Yeah. My, my, I guess my point was more about the fact that you physically, con consciously don't, you know, you're trying to. There's, there's almost this issue about mistaken identity, which we have to put up with post 9-11. And you know that the airport's what we suffered. Yeah, and we've done a separate <laughs> program on that before. But my, my question was more around the fact, and I, I picked it up from once. It's amazing when you meet someone and someone gives you something and it's quite profound and it kind of rings in your head. It resonates in your head in terms of the fact that we do a lot of work, Sikhs do a lot of work anyway, and it's more, if it, the more humanitarian work we do, the more we're recognised as being the humanitarians that we yeah. actually are. And so you're not consciously doing the work mm. to be seen to be uh, to be humanitarian, but by doing humanitarian work, the, some, the side effect is mm. they say, "Well, Sikhs are not what other people are trying to uh, you know to pitch them to be. People that have got alternative agendas. What we're doing is we're setting our own agenda and saying, look, we need to help people, right? And if they recognise the fact that we are helping them, 
it doesn't matter whether you're black, yellow, green, orange. You get on with it. You, you get on with it, and you just do it. It's just it, it comes back to the fact that you're you're doing it from the heart. And okay, the, ha the fact that you happen to be a Sikh, then that's that's a positive thing that that person can see, you know, the beauty in that that individual, you know. Um, so I guess the question really focuses more on the importance of doing humanitarian work, not necessarily just for who we are, but more in terms of what you are and what you can do and what you can contribute to the world, you know. I think, uh, like you said, we don't go out in the world to wave, you know, say we're Sikhs, just like we said, mentioned before. We get on with it, um, and Haiti, where we worked in the Afghan region, we've never seen Sikhs before, you know, and now they say, we love you, we love the Sikhs. Yeah. And it's not like we say, look, you know, every spoon fed or every, you know, bottle of water we give them, we're them. a Sikh, you know, we're Sikhs, and we say we're the best and we give you a bottle of drink or whatever. It's a... Uh, you know, like Sikhs are the natural United Nations of the world, you know, like the, the, the issue with the, the identity we've been given, yeah. Turban the Beard, is to approach us and if you need anything or any help, shelter, food, we should be able to provide that. So a Sikh's identity is a saint soldier. Mm. You know, we're sun spies. That's the real meaning of sun spy, Sikh, saint soldier. Right. You know, you, you remember God, you fear God, and, but when it comes to be a soldier, you don't look back. Are you religious anyway, yourself? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but then um, I think I said this once on the Channel before. One of the captions he has on the T-shirts is the recognises the human race as one, right. which is kind of probably the one thing I probably would stand for. Mm. And it's why I'm, you know didn't even have to think twice about volunteering mm. and representing the charity. I was proud to do it. Very good. Yeah. And growing up, I've obviously had seek friends since I was very little and very aware of the culture and really respect it. I, I got one question for you. Why, why, I think there are some calls coming through actually, but um, how do you, how do you personally? You can ask this question as well. How do you personally stay calm? Right. What do you do? Do you like do you like close your eyes and go, wow, I better just kind of breathe a few you know bits and then kind of open my eyes again and trying to deal with the issue. What do you do? Because um, it's a shock, isn't it? Like you said with your friends, you know. Yeah. I mean, I just, just have to accept things. I mean, this is the way it is. And so the sooner you get over thinking, well, am I you know, out of my comfort or not? Just don't think about it. Just go along with it. Um, and then the goodness of the people we were with came through. So I just felt so comfortable after only a couple of days. Because um, I think when we first went, the rabbi was, it was just off, literally we took off the day the Japanese disaster happened. And he was getting phone calls you know, constantly and it was costing me a lot. And within a couple of days, I was happy for him to go, leave me with the other chap who was with us at the time, because mm -hmm. I felt so comfortable and safe there. Not naive, because it still was quite dangerous, but because the people were just very friendly, and you just get over that shock and just try and make the most of the experience. Okay, now this, you're going to go back. You've been there twice, right? So one of the things that we touched on earlier on was it's still bad out there. Okay, mm -hmm. now I wanted to explore with you um, does the media suddenly stop talking about it and then it kind of goes away because it's like yesterday's news? Um, how do we how do we deal with that as a as a world people? Would you do you think the media got responsibility to keep it in keep those you know pointers out there and say you really need more help? We need to. I guess what it is is the things that we've touched on. Or we've touched on economics and we start touched on politics. If they go out the window, they're not in the newspapers. Therefore. Everyone thinks it's all solved and everything's nice and hunky dory, but the fact is the politics and the economics continue, don't they? Yeah. So, sh what's your view on that? Um, well, definitely. I mean, I think that's with the people we we're working with. You know, they they still speak to us a lot because they're just trying to keep them. Um, you know, on Facebook, they'll still message me to see how I am, so that they keep. I've always got hate in my mind, but you know, again, it's the attention's just gone off, and unless something bad happens there, we're not going to hear about Haiti again. Mm. Um, but if you've started off these programs, for example, that, that t-shirt place that you rebuilt, or you know, you've done some work out there, how do you keep that, how do you keep that going in terms of, um, because I overthink needs money for one thing. The thing is uh, Haiti, what, what people don't realise, when Haiti happened, billions were raised. And a lot of Gurdwara, most of the Gurdwara in the UK supported Carl Said, so money came in. So we could have done two, three months keep sending press releases, we've done it, blah, 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 go home. But well, well, what we've done, we set, when we set the camp up last year, 2010, February, it was for long term. Eight, nine months the camp was there. And then even without the camp, teams kept going every month or two months. So 
so they'll keep uh, supplying those orphan orphanages, repairing the water pumps that are damaged, because the water pump we put in, you know, they're not industrial strengths, so they need repairs. So when somebody goes, they do repairs, install another water pump. So our program continues, you know, like we sat on the money and say, thank you very much. Right. Um, somebody else paid for something, we just put the money somewhere safe. It's all the, gen the public is very generous, they need to call aid, which we're very grateful for. And like I said before, and I'll say it again, we want to be a millionaire organization. I'm not hiding the fact, but it doesn't mean that we don't deliver what we're meant to deliver. So our program continues to Haiti even I guess two years coming up in January and we're still continuing. My, my question is more about the fact that the press sometimes forgets about it, doesn't it? It says like, mm -hmm. here we go, it's not on there anymore, uh, it's not on the agenda. So what, what do you think we can do to help keep that profile raised? Who has the responsibility to keep it in the public eye? The charity has. But yeah, but nobody listens to small charities. Mm. Okay. Disasters happen every day. The Africa, one that we delivered aid to recently, famines are huge. Uh, there's other disasters. The media is only good for you know what the public interest is. Do you not think that people have a um, have a responsibility as well? Those that live at home, who don't go out like you do, they've got a responsibility to write to their MP or you know uh, talk to their local charities, or for example. Um, if they've got relatives or people that they know to bring those stories into the into the light so that people can see yeah, they could probably do a little bit more because that's what people are um, it's the biggest channel of information um, so that you know when the famine there was a lot of um, talk and when our bank people were actually coming in and asking to make donations because it was all in the news now the family in Ethiopia has sort of died down, mm. you don't hear it as much, and the interest fades away. And that's the same about Haiti, whereas maybe a year ago you'd say, Haiti, oh yeah, the earthquake. Mm. Now, some people you kind of have to remind, yeah, they had the big earthquake, because out of their mind. And I say, I think they could do a little bit more to maybe just give an update on how things are, because I think people would be quite shocked a year and a half on um, the state of the place compared to where it was just after the earthquake. Is it getting worse, or do you think it's marginally getting better? Marginally, I think I saw a little bit of improvements here and there when my second visit, but for the amount of money that was raised, awful. That really was awful. So the money's gone somewhere, right? No, I think a lot of it's still sitting there in interest, if you believe some of the things you hear in the papers. <laughs> well, for Tsunami, I think they raised somewhere to go and spend it. Right. So where's the interest going on that? Okay. I just think that maybe there's an opportunity sometimes for the public, you know, to kind of demand uh, governments do more or economists do more or the fact that it's raised as they, they write to the local newspaper and say, or even the national paper and, and write a letter in the Times, you know, start answering people's blogs, you know, trying to raise the profile that if you don't see it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the problem's not actually there. It's still there. It's still happening, you know. Mm. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because we all live our daily lives, and we forget <laughs> the fact that there's out so of much sight, out of mind, out mm. of sight, out of mind, isn't it? You know, but um, you know that that was the reason why I really, when Ravi and I were talking the other day on the phone, I said that it would be great to have you on the program because you can give us um, a first impression about it. What's what's your hope when you go back? What what do you think about doing when you go back? Have you got things that you're going to be doing? I was discussing possibly doing a sort of a Christmas mission to the food parcels to the children to want to show that we haven't forgotten about them because you speak to us, uh, any of the pastors at these orphanages, they love Calcere because they've actually seen us go there and they know that when we go there, we're going to help. Um, that, you know, they've got paintings with Calcere written, they've mm -hmm. got the scarves. Yeah. That. <laughs> really? That's interesting. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're, what they've achieved there, and every time when they bring someone new, they walk in, the pastor will take my friends around and say, Calcere did this, uh, they, they even say Parmigit did mm. this, and they remember, they remember yeah. but they really respect it because we don't just say, you know, let's talk, we've gone out, and as soon as we get there, we work hard, um, spend money on them, and then so when they go, they're really gutted to see us leave. Right, yeah, that's amazing. So when you go back, you think you'll do some Christmas stuff for the kids? Yeah, we're it? looking into it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, if any viewers who are want to help Andrew, we can have one other male person going, because if we're sharing a room you with Andrew... You've got opportunity there if you want to go out there, <laughs> accompany Andrew. Not only that, but we say to people, if, you know, if 
people who are comfortable, they've got good money coming in and they want to share that money with somebody unfortunate, mm. you know, you've got a few thousand dollars a pound spare, he's, he's going to go and deliver eight to six, seven orphanages at the time of the year when the kids have their mums and dads and these guys don't have their mums and dads. Right. You are, we are, he is their mums and dads. You know, they love people coming in and the children, they're so loving and you're going to give them Christmas food, something a bit different, maybe sweets or something they can enjoy, proper food. And uh, so if somebody listening out there, yeah, or a good guy want to sponsor it, you know, he'll make sure with another guy to go out there and deliver it. Well, this will be a very short trip, by the way, only like four or five days. It's solid, pick up the stuff on the market, which we know, deliver, pick up, deliver, pick up, deliver and return. So we can do all that in about three, four days. Yeah, and what can, um, so is that something that you're going to buy out there or is that something We buy locally, we buy everything locally. Right, okay. Uh, the weight limit and also the customs are so corrupt over there, they'll right. take everything out of your bag saying this can't be allowed. We didn't talk touch on the corruption, <laughs> how deep the corruption is. Over right, there. but you have to try and avoid that though, don't you? We avoid it in many ways we can, like we will not work with government officials, we will, uh, even the local mayor of that area wanted money from the NGOs. Mm. So we employ people locally, you know, there's, like in Punjab, India, same thing, you got traditional builders, traditional well diggers who dig a well with this metal plate. So pay them a few hundred dollars instead of paying three thousand dollars to an American or European contractor who will just pocket most of the money. Right. So they dig it, they live in the community, anything goes wrong, they fix it. So we keep everything local and we're trying to buy much but the food is so expensive, mm. everything expensive. Mm. But you know, some things you have to buy locally. And uh, but you know, I think the way we work, as we're hands on, we're trying to minimize that. The more middlemen you have, the more corruption that will come for like, so if I say to you Right, here's two thousand dollars. Buy food for the orphanage. You might keep five hundred, give him fifteen hundred. You'll keep five hundred, give a thousand, and the food comes to five hundred. So we avoid that. It's a sad situation in the world where even you know where you would think that someone would try and help somebody else, they're also looking after number one, which is themselves. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a voodoo country as well, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> is it, is it <laughs> Heartland of voodoo where we stay. That is a main voodoo country. You were shocked when you found that. Only voodoo churches. We just tried to that? stay. But yeah, it's true. Um, but don't let me, don't put that on, because <laughs> the Buddha music is great. It's great, right. soothing music. Right. Pulls you. <laughs> oh my word. Okay. Um, well, we've come to the end, actually. We have a 45-minute show that we run every week on a Friday. Um, I'd like to thank my guests who've um, come along uh, all this way, uh, all the way from Slough. Uh, yeah, uh, very far. Uh, just quite far. Uh, and I appreciate you know, all the insight. And it probably gets quite hard as well to try and remember... You know, because you, you kind of get that imagery as well, don't you? No, oh, no, it'll never go away. Yeah? Yeah, nice and fresh, too. Okay, well, you know, you're going to have a great trip. I mean, just to kind of cover some of the things that we've been talking about today, we've, we've heard firsthand of some of the experiences. Sometimes when somebody goes out there and they feel so, uh, so hard about, you know, seeing what's going on, um, we do actually have time just to take a call, actually. Um, Can I also yeah. just say one thing? Sure. Well, two things. Yeah. One is... I want to say thanks to SEEK, S-E-E-Q, okay. S-W-E-Q, they're doing a the football tournament. Yeah. Brilliant organisation, youngsters in the Midlands. They're sporting cars in the tournament this year. Brilliant. And also Punjabi school, Denmark, Prabhjot Singh, okay. contacted us. They want to support Carl Said from Denmark. Mm -hmm. This is what Carl Said is, you know, people who make it, Carl Said. And also the fundraiser's latest bike ride. I, bike bike ride? I heard about that amazing bike ride. It's an amazing bike ride. Yeah. Well done, everyone. Bikes in Scotland. Sorry, take the call. Let's take the call. Um, and then we'll...